welcome back. So, before the break I was discussing about the um, capital asset pricing model, the derivation of the capital asset pricing model and as I explained the Markowitz model requires that we maximize the sharp ratio that every investor maximizes the sharp ratio in order to arrive at his efficient frontier. Uh, and considering that particular aspect or developing on that particular aspect rather what we ended up uh, uh, was that if uh, the equation number 2 b you can see here, uh, if the left hand side of equation number 2 b is uh, greater than the right hand side, then what people would do is uh, they would invest more and more in security as they would borrow at the risk free rate and we keep on investing in security as to add it to their portfolio p to form the portfolio t. And of course, if the left hand side is less than the right hand side of uh, equation to b, then what would happen? The inverse process that is shorting security as and uh, investing at the risk free rate would take place. So, the bottom line is that in this situation uh, at equilibrium it, uh, it uh, follows that it is absolutely necessary that the equality should hold. It is only when there would be equality that the market would be a stable market would be in equilibrium. So, and this expression that we have here forms the premise of the CAPM model on the on the basis of the assumptions that we have already made as I will explain now. Now, under the CAPM assumptions all investors want to maximize the sharp ratio. This is the input from the Markowitz model because the CAPM model builds on the Markowitz model. It assumes that investors behave as per the Markowitz framework. The investors take Markowitz model for granted for constructing of their optimal portfolios. So, uh, this input is from the Markowitz model that all investors want to maximize the sharp ratio. All investors work on the same estimates of input, this we have expl explicitly assumed when we talked about the assumptions in the CAPM model. That all investors in so far as the estimates that go into the development of the Markowitz model, development or computation of the efficient frontier uh, are assumed to be same by all the investors. That means, all the investors because they have the same inputs and they have the same objective function that is the sharp ratio, they have the same objective function, they have the same inputs, this is the assumption of the uh, uh, CAPM model, the objective function is the assumption of the Markowitz model and on the premise that uh, the two hold together, it means that every assumption, every investor, now this is important, every investor will end up with the same highest sharp ratio, because the inputs that are going into the calculation of the sharp ratio is the same. So, the output must be the same and the uh, um, maximum sharp ratio as calculated by each and every investor would be the same. That means, what all investors will hold the same risky portfolio. Why? Because they are all of them are maximizing the sharp ratio. So, all of them have the same inputs all of them have the same objective functions, they end up with the same output that is they maximize the same uh, same combination or they, uh, they invest in the same combination of risky assets. So, all investors have the same risky portfolio. That means what? That means, because each and every investor is hold, no this is important you need to understand this. Each and every investor is holding the same set of securities in the same proportion what does it mean? That means, the market outstanding of that each and every security must also be in the same proportion. For example, let me take an example. Let us say we have got three investors x, y and z and let us say we have got three securities a, b and c. Uh, let us say a, each of these investors a, a, x, y and z are holding the securities in the ratio 3 is to 2 is to 1. They hold security A in B and C, a, X holds security A, B and C in the ratio 3 is to 2 is to 1, Y holds the security A, B and C in the ratio 3 is to 2 is to 1, Z holds the securities A, B and C in the ratio 3 is to 2 is to 1. What will be the market outstanding of securities a, a, B and C? They also have to be in the ratio 3 is to 1. That is what we are trying to convey here. That because each and every investor is holding the same proportion of risky assets, that proportion of risky assets must be replicated or must be the market portfolio must represent the outstandings that are there in the market of each of those securities. 
Thus, the same risky portfolio must be the market portfolio. Thus, the market portfolio is the portfolio with the higher sharp ratio because each investor is holding that portfolio which gives him the higher sharp ratio and the higher sharp ratio is the same for all the investors. Therefore, all the investors are holding the same proportion of uh, risky securities and therefore, the same proportion of risky securities must be reflected in the market in outstandings. Market outstandings must consist of the same proportion of securities uh, uh, of risky assets and therefore, the market portfolio must also be the portfolio which has the highest sharp ratio. The proportion will therefore, also constitute the market composition of risky assets that I have already explained. Now, if the market portfolio has the highest attainable sharp ratio, there is no way to obtain a higher sharp ratio by holding more or less of any one asset. We have already said that the market portfolio is the portfolio with the higher sharp ratio. So, you cannot improve upon that ratio by either buying or selling of any security and therefore, you cannot obtain a higher sharp ratio by holding more or less of any asset. Now, as I mentioned, investors will hold the risky assets in the same relative proportion because of they have the same inputs that go into the Markowitz uh, objective function depend now how does it actually operate you you will contend that how can it be that every investor has the same portfolio if they don't have the same portfolio they have the same uh, proportion of risky assets in their risk component of their portfolio their actual portfolio will comprise of two parts the risk free asset and the risky portfolio the proportion of risky assets in the risky portfolio will be the same for each investor that is the important part. The proportion of risky assets, risky securities in the risky portfolio will be the same across all the investors, but they do not hold the risky portfolio alone. What they hold is a combination of the risky portfolio and the risk free asset either long or short whether riskless lending or riskless borrowing. What does it depend on? It depends on the risk return profile. It depends on the risk, uh, uh, indif risk return indifference curve. How risk taking or risk averse the investor is will determine what is the composition of the risk free asset and what is the composition of the risky portfolio. The basic thing is as far as the risky portfolio is concerned, the content of all the securities in the risky portfolio remains uniform across all the investors. That is the, that is the outcome of the Sharpe model. It is not that everybody is investing in just the risky portfolio alone. No, no, no. It is the risky portfolio plus the risk free asset. The combination would be determined by the risk profile or the risk attitude of the investor. Uh, risk averse investor will hold more content of risk free uh, asset and less content of risky, uh, risky asset. Uh, a risk taking individual will invest more in the risky portfolio less in the uh, risk free asset. He may even borrow at the risk free rate and invest in the risky asset. So, that is how the optimal portfolio for a particular investor would be determined. It would be determined by the interaction of his indifference map or his utility function with the efficient frontier. So, applying the CAPM improvement rule, what we end up with is because the portfolio P that we have talked about is now the market portfolio because it is a market portfolio held by all the investors. So, what we end up with that applying the portfolio improvement rule, it follows that the risk premium on each asset must satisfy this linear equation R s is equal to R f plus beta s into R m minus R f where R s is the expected return please note this on security s and R m is the expected return on the market portfolio. Now, I take up another approach a slightly more direct approach to the derivation of the CAPM model. This the, the earlier approach that I have taken up uh, was uh, uh, retained uh, to bring to you a certain rationale behind this uh, behind the CAPM approach which this particular derivation probably uh, uh, camouflages to some extent uh, to uh, it covers up to some extent but the earlier approach was more may not be so direct but it was more uh, educative more informative more logical this approach is more mathematical and more uh, precise you may say but it misses out on the nuances of the CAPM model but 
but nevertheless let us take it up. The mean variance optimization equations are the equations that we, we are now very much accustomed to. Uh, this is equation number 4 on the slide, where z i is equal to lambda x i, where lambda is equal to E R P that is expected return on portfolio P minus R F divided by sigma P square. We have discussed this uh, uh, in a lot of detail uh, when we talked about the uh, three security problem. So, R K R bar K minus R F is given by lambda summation x. Here. This is simply substituting z i equal to lambda x i in equation number 4, what we get is equation number 6. Please note, I have written equation number 4, the, the uh, right hand side of equation number 4 in a more concise form, where I have removed the constraint j e unequal to i, because when j is equal to i, what do we get? We get z i uh, sigma i square, which is nothing but the first term on the, uh, on the right hand side, this term. And that means what? That means that uh, if I remove this constraint j unequal to i, I can incorporate the first term within the summation itself. And that is precisely what I have done. So, in the second, uh, uh, second term uh, or the second equation that is the equation number 5, we have used z i is equal to lambda x i and using this expression, we have rewritten equation number 4 as equation number 6. Now, by definition, the covariance between securities J and K is given by or the covariance between the returns on securities J and K is given by the expression that is the top equation on this slide, sigma J K is equal to expected value of R J minus R J bar into R K minus R K bar. Multiplying by J uh, or rather X J, I am sorry, multiplying by X J and summing over j equal to 1 to n, what we get is equation number 7, where we have assumed that, where we have used the property of expectation that it uh, distributes over the uh, excess. So, and that being the case, what we have now here is j equal to 1 to n summation x j sigma j k is given is equal to the expression that is equation number 7 here. Now, this is what we have from the earlier slide, equation number 7. Now, under the CAPM assumptions, which I discussed in a lot of detail a few minutes back, summation of R j x j over all the securities, because every, let me repeat once more, because every investor in the market is holding the risky securities in the same proportion. Therefore, that proportion must also be the proportion of market outstandings. We use this property here and we write what do we write? We write R summation j equal to 1 to n R j x j as R m, the weighted average, because now you see the x j so far is the is the uh, proportion of risky securities in the investors portfolio, but because that same uh, proportion is the market outstanding, I can take this x j as the market outstanding, multiply it by the respective returns, expected returns and what do I get? I get the expected return on the market. That is the uh, that is the rational underlying this equation uh, summation j equal to 1 to n r j x j is equal to r m. So, that what we end up with is uh, using equation number 7 and using this particular property what we get is summation j equal to 1 to n x j summation j uh, sigma j k x j sigma j k is equal to sigma m k. This is equation number 8, where we have simply substituted for summation r j x j and r bar j x j in terms of the market uh, uh, portfolio. Now, we, are, we return to equation number 8, which was there on the previous slide. Suppose, we take k is equal to m, then what we end up with is j equal to 1 to n summation x j sigma j m is equal to sigma m square. Uh, also, from equation number 6, what we have r k minus r f is equal to lambda summation j equal to 1 to n x j sigma j k. Setting k equal to m in equation number 6, what do I get? r bar m minus r f is equal to lambda summation x j summation j m. Now, if uh, substituting from equation number 9 here, what I get is um, r bar j, uh, r bar m minus r f 
is equal to lambda sigma m square, where I have substituted from equation number 1, 9 in equation number, let us call this equation number 9 a. So, I have substituted from equation number 9 in equation number 9 a on the right hand side and what I get is r bar m minus r f is equal to lambda sigma m square. Therefore, what is lambda? Lambda is equal to r bar m minus r f divided by sigma m square. Lambda is equal to r bar m minus r f divided by sigma m square. So, now, substituting in equation number 6, what I get is r k minus r f is equal to lambda into what is this expression? This expression is sigma m k or sigma k m. The, this is summation j equal to 1 to n x j sigma j k is equal to sigma m k and lambda is equal to what? Lambda is equal to r bar m minus r f divided by sigma m square. So, we have got both these terms on the right hand side. We have got lambda right hand side of equation number 6. We have got lambda is equal to r bar m minus r f upon sigma m square and we have got sigma x j sigma j k is equal to sigma m k. So, substituting these values what we get is equation number 10. Now, sigma k m divided by sigma m square is nothing but beta uh, k m or the regression coefficient of uh, the security of the returns on security k uh, regressed upon the returns on security or market m. So, that is nothing but the CAPM model. Now, a quick relook at the relationship between CAPM and SIM model, single index model. The single index model is represented by the first equation on your slide and the CAPM model is represented by the second equation. If you look at the second equation, the second equation can be written in the form of the third equation. Uh, this let us call this equation number 1, let us call it 2, let us call it 3. And uh, from the third equation, what we find is that uh, the CAPM model uh, on the basis of the assumptions as to the market and the investor behavior of the uh, various constituents uh, that uh, interplay uh, in the investment decisions. Um, what we end up with that alpha of the single index model in the long run should approach 0. And what does it mean? It means that in the long run, the excess return on any security uh, uh, in the long run would be uh, determined by its exposure to the market or the systematic risk you may say uh, and uh, times the excess return on the market. Let me repeat, the excess return on any security uh, in the market will be determined by its relationship with the market returns multiplied by the excess return on the market which is equation number 3. And uh, for any particular observation, we can write the single index, uh, we can write the kappa model as equation number 4. And equation number 5 gives you the various assumptions that underline both the single index and the kappa model. So, partitioning of return into market related return and random return uh, that is the assumption of the single index model and R m uh, the expression R m minus R f is called the equity risk premium and beta i R m minus R f is called the excess return of security uh, uh, i. So, these are uh, what, I, what you call the inputs that go into the CAPM model. Uh, what does the CAPM model tell us? The CAPM model tells us number 1 that standalone risk can be, can be measured by variance. In fact, the standalone risk should be measured by variance. Why? Because it is the total risk of a security. The total risk of a security is likely to contain a significant component of uh, the residual risk and therefore, it is appropriate that when you are handling individual securities, you should focus on total risk because the, the component of 
uh, unsystematic risk or the residual risk would also be significant when we are talking about an isolated security. So, in so far as an individual security is concerned, we should a focus on the measuring of the risk of individual securities by the standalone risk, which is the variance or the standard deviation risk. But standalone risk is not the appropriate measure of risk in the stock market. You can see here, you can see here in this equation for this Kappa model, uh, equation number 2. If you look at equation number 2 carefully, the re expected return on a security S is determined only by its beta and what is beta? Beta is the regression of the securities returns with the market returns. In other words, beta depicts the systematic relationship between the security returns and the market returns. So, that means what? That means, the expected returns on a given security are influenced by or are related to the market returns rather than the total market risk, I am sorry, rather than the total uh, risk. The ri risk on a particular security, uh, individual security uh, is, uh, uh, I am sorry, the return on a particular security, uh, individual security, the expected return on an individual security is related to the expected return on the market uh, uh, portfolio. So, that is, that means what? That means, we are focusing on the systematic relationship between the uh, the uh, the security and the market and it is the systematic relationship which generates returns for the individual security and it is the 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 component of risk which is random which is unsystematic which is uh, is not rewarded by the market why does the market not do so why does the market not reward uh, not reward unsystematic risk the market does not reward unsystematic risk because the market feels that all the market players have good enough portfolios have sufficiently diversified portfolios have undertaken sufficient diversifications to eliminate um, the unsystematic risk to the to the minimal level, to the insignificant level and therefore, the market says that you, I will reward you only if you take the uh, systematic risk if you or the re return that is uh, going to be derived by a security, the expected return that is going to be derived by a sec security would be determined by how, how much exposure it has to the market in terms of the market fluctuations, how large is the fluctuations in the amplitudes of the given security in relation to the market rather. So, that is the important thing. So, standalone risk is not the appropriate measure of risk in the stock market. I repeat, as far as the stock market is concerned, it is the market risk that is important as per the CAPM assumptions. Uh, the larger is the systematic risk that you are willing to take, the larger would be your expected returns, but the larger the total risk you are going, uh, willing to take may not necessarily be rewarded by larger expected returns. Let me repeat this fundamental statement. The larger is the systematic risk that you are willing to take, the risk associated with the market fluctuations, the larger would be the expected return on your portfolio uh, depending on the value of beta, the, co co the regression coefficient. And the not necessarily so that larger is the total risk that you are taking it may be rewarded by larger expected returns. So, beta measures, uh, beta offers a method of measuring the risk of an asset that cannot be diversified away, that is the market risk. Now, beta is a measure of market risk. I just said that beta offers a method of measuring the market risk. Let me try to justify the statement. The standard deviation of a market portfolio is given by this expression that you have on the slide, where all x x i m s are market proportions. I repeat, the standard deviation of the market portfolio, you are talking about the market portfolio and because you are talking about the market for portfolio, the standard deviation of the market portfolio would, uh, would be determined by the market proportions and therefore, all the x i m s that are included here are the market proportions. Now, because all investors hold the market portfolio, this is fundamental, because all investors hold the market portfolio, the relevant definition of the risk of a security is the change in the risk of the market portfolio as the holdings of that security are varied. Let me repeat this statement, because all investors 
hold the market portfolio, the relevant definition of risk of a security is the change in the risk of the market portfolio as the holdings of the security are varied. So, what do we do? We differentiate the market standard deviation by the composition of various securities. In other words, we work out d sigma m upon d x i m and what we end up with after some algebra is the value of beta i. So, beta i it is that represents the market risk in the CAPM framework. It is or therefore, it is the CAPM framework uh, usually is also called the beta risk framework. It is the framework where the beta encapsulates the relationship between the expected returns and the uh, expected returns on the market and the expected returns on the security. So, let us now recap the key takeaways from the CAPM model. The total risk of a stock oblique portfolio can be segregated into two orthogonal components market risk or systematic risk and singular risk or unsystematic risk. Market does not price total risk. I repeat this statement market does not price total risk. If you take more total risk, you may not necessarily be rewarded by higher expected returns, but if you take higher systematic risk, you would be rewarded by higher expected returns. This is the philosophy of this CAPM model. Market does not reward investors for taking unsystematic risk. Let us understand the implications of the above takeaways. Consider a portfolio P having sigma P equal to 6 percent and beta equal to 1. Let market sigma sigma M be 4 percent, let R F be 3 percent and R M be 12 percent. Let us assume that we have a portfolio and the market having the given parameters. Then we have using the CAPM model, what do we get? We get R p is equal to 12 percent and sigma systematic of portfolio p is 4 percent and the unsystematic risk is 4.47 percent. Thus, on the average portfolio p will give a expected return of 12 percent. Of course, every observation would not return on return would not yield 12 percent, there would be a strong random component that contributes to the standard deviation of 4.47 percent. Now, compare this portfolio P with another portfolio Q that has sigma Q equal to 6 percent, sigma Q is 6 percent, what was sigma P? Sigma P was also 6 percent. So, P and Q have the same total risk, but what is special about Q? beta is 1.50. What was beta of p? Beta of p was 1.00. So, the portfolio q has higher uh, systematic risk than portfolio p, but portfolio q has the same total risk as portfolio p. I repeat portfolio q has higher systematic risk than portfolio p, but portfolio q has the same total risk as portfolio P. What is the implication? The expected return on the portfolio Q, it will be 16.5 percent. The expected return on portfolio B, uh, portfolio Q will be 16.5 percent. What was the expected return on portfolio P? It was 12 percent. So, notwithstanding that fact that portfolio P and Q have the same level of total risk, portfolio Q is awarding you a higher expected return of 16.5 percent compared to portfolio P which is giving you 12 percent. This example clearly brings uh, forth the fact that market may not reward total risk with higher expected returns. The total risk on P and Q is the same. So, if market was to reward uh, total risk, then expected returns on P and Q would have to be the same, but that is not the case. What is happening here is that the expected returns on portfolio Q are higher than the expected return on portfolio P. And why is that? Because the systematic risk of portfolio Q as captured by beta is more compared to the systematic risk of portfolio P because its beta is lower. And because Q has a higher systematic risk and because 
because market rewards systematic risk. So, because Q has higher systematic risk, it Q ends up with a higher expected returns. So, that is the relationship between P and Q. So, an investor who is investing in Q can expect a higher return because he is taking a higher systematic risk which is concerned by the market to be the relevant risk. Let us look at another portfolio S. What is the salient? What are the cardinals of S? The cardinals of S are R S is equal to 12 percent, sigma systematic is uh, I am sorry the cardinals of S are sigma S is equal to 4 percent and beta is equal to 1. What does it mean? It means that it means R S is equal to 12 percent, but what about the systematic risk of S? The systematic of risk of S is only 4 percent and it has no unsystematic risk. So, what does it mean? It means that the total risk of S is only 4 percent. What was the total risk of P? The total risk of P is 6 percent. So, what does it mean? Let us try to understand this. It means uh, that the total risk of P and S is the same. Uh, I am sorry, the return on S, P and S is the same, both are giving you 12 percent returns expected returns, but if you look at the total risk, the total risk of uh, P is higher, it is 6 percent, the total risk of S is only 4 percent. So, in other words, we are able to achieve the same expected return with a lower total, uh, with a lower uh, uh, what you call uh, total risk. It means that there is greater certainty of portfolio S achieving that return of 12 percent compared to the return that is uh, uh, compared to the certainty of the generation of returns by the portfolio P. So, again we find that portfolio S is superior to portfolio P. Portfolio S is having uh, same expected return as portfolio P, but it is having a lower total risk. As you can see here, uh, uh, sigma systematic is only 4 percent and unsystematic is 0. So, the total risk is only 4 percent, whereas in the case of in the uh, in the port case of portfolio P, the total risk was 6 percent. So, again we, we, we end up with this uh, with the very fact that uh, S will give you the same average return as P, but with lesser fluctuations, less, lesser chance or uh, lesser uncertainty, lesser chance of not realizing of those returns. So, this is a table which illustrates whatever I have explained in the last few minutes. Uh, you have the portfolio M which is a market portfolio, which is obviously an efficient portfolio, which has no unsystematic risk. The portfolio P that had a component of systematic and unsystematic risk, portfolio Q which had the same uh, total risk at portfolio as portfolio P, but had no unsystematic risk and therefore, because market rewarded systematic risk and it Q had a higher systematic risk, it ended up with a higher return and then we put we had portfolio S which had the same expected return as portfolio P, but it has a lower total risk. So, again what we end up with is uh, that market rewards only systematic risk, systematic risk, it does not reward unsystematic risk. So, this derivation of systematic and unsystematic risk is absolutely parallel to the corresponding derivation that in fact, we also touched upon right at the beginning of this lecture, beginning of the prior lecture in fact, uh, absolutely parallel. So, I will not spend time on it. The net result is that beta i square sigma m square gives you the systematic risk and sigma e i square gives you the unsystematic risk, absolutely similar expression to what we have for the uh, a single index model. You know, there is one important observation that I would like to give. The unsystematic risk must necessarily be random. The unsystematic risk must necessarily be random and uncorrelated with the systematic risk. Why? Because if there was any pattern in it, if there was any pattern in the unsystematic risk, it would immediately be deciphered by the market players and it would be captured by the market price of the relevant asset it would be absorbed in the pricing process. So, consequently it would become a part of the systematic risk. So, let me repeat the unsystematic risk must be random and unsystematic risk will not be associated with the systematic risk because if it so happens if the unsystematic risk has a some kind of a pattern it would be captured by the market in its pricing process and there, thereby it would become a part of the systematic risk.
this is as far as the portfolio beta is concerned. This is a proof that the portfolio beta, uh, beta of a portfolio is equal to the weighted average beta of its constituents. I repeat the beta of a portfolio is equal to the weighted average beta of its constituents. It is algebraically proved here. Again, the derivation is quite straightforward. So, let us not spend time on it. In the next lecture, I will start with the capital market line and the security market line and then we will move to the arbitrage pricing theory. Thank you.